The Dar es Salaam was a cargo passenger ship named after the largest city in the East African country of Tanzania, or Tanganyika as it was known in the early 20th century. It was built by Hamburg-based German shipbuilder Blom and Voss for a Turkish client and named Savas. The ship was 121.79 meters or 399.57 feet long and 16.05 meters or 52.65 feet wide with a draft or minimum depth requirement of 6.62 meters or 21.71 feet. The Dar es Salaam was built to accommodate 629 passengers and could hit a respectable top speed of 16 knots or 18.4 miles per hour. However, it was the outbreak of the Second World War, and the brand new ship was never delivered to Turkey. Instead, it served for a brief time as part of the Africa Line. It was then confiscated by the German Navy in 1941 and renamed the Dar es Salaam to be used as an accommodation or residential ship in Kiel Harbor on Germany's Baltic Sea coast. Before that, the Dar es Salaam was used by the Kriegsmarine as an auxiliary and target ship for the 26th U Flotilla in Pilau in what was then Eastern Prussia. Pilau at that time was also a U-boat training facility. The ship then served with the U Flotilla in Memel from January 1, 1943 to July 16, 1944. The Dar es Salaam then became an S-boat escort ship before its final role as a residential ship for the Kriegsmarine. Just two months later, on September 16, 1944, it was hit by a bomb while berthed in Kiel Blücherbrücke, in which its bridge burned out. However, the greatest tragedy on board the Dar es Salaam would happen less than four months later. It too happened in Kiel Harbor, and it took place on a night in January 1945. However, before we cover the events of that night, let's offer some information regarding Kiel Harbor and its pivotal naval role during the Second World War. We thought it a good idea to do so given how many videos this channel has dedicated to Nazi Germany's formidable U-boat division. Kiel is today the capital and most populous city in the northern German state of Schleswig-Holstein. Situated approximately 90 kilometers or 56 miles north of Hamburg, the port of Kiel has always been a prime location for Germany's maritime exploits, including being one of the traditional homes of the country's Baltic fleet. The main hub for U-boats was at its hub, named Killian, in Kiel. The site was designed and purpose-built to offer U-boats as much protection from enemy attacks as possible. Construction commenced in 1941 and went on until 1943, using workers comprised of prisoners of war and people interned at nearby labor camps. No bunkers or any protection was offered to these workers during construction, which meant mortality rates were high due to air raids conducted by Allied forces. The docking of U-boats at the facility was not possible. Instead, U-boats were kept afloat under a ceiling that consisted of pre-stressed concrete layers that were up to 15.75 feet or 4, 8 meters in thickness. The enclosed area or pen included two boxes each with a length of 150 meters or just under 500 feet, each containing berths that were over 138 meters or 453 feet per side. The pen was cordoned off by hanging steel gates on the harbor side. That meant that the Killian site at Kiel was the only German base where two U-boats could be berthed bow to stern. A minimum of 12 7C U-boats could be berthed at Killian at any one time. The Killian facility was finally consecrated on November 13, 1943, with U-1101 being the first U-boat to enter it six days later. 200,000 cubic meters, or over 656,000 cubic feet of concrete were used by the construction company, Dykerhoff and Widman AG, to build the U-boat facility. Such was the heavy construction of the facility, that destroying it at the end of the war was no easy task. The last air raid had taken place at midnight on May 2, 1945, and Killian lay in near ruins. Germany was near in defeat, and U-Boat Command had ordered that the remaining U-Boats go out to sea or be scuttled. Yet the Allies were determined to completely obliterate one of the last vestiges of Nazi naval pride. Preparations to do just that commenced on September 1, 1945, by the Guardian Division engineers under the leadership of Lt. Col. Ian e. Blickford. It took three weeks for 288 holes to be drilled, each injected with 0, 
57 kilograms or 1.25 pounds of explosives. A further 107 bombs with 113 kilogram or 249 pounds explosives were also to be used. In all, 12.3 tons of explosives went off on October 25, 1945. That is what was needed to destroy the U-boat Killian facility once and for all. Also destroyed were U-4708 and other small craft, which were buried under tons of concrete. Nearly 50 years later, in May 1994, several holes at the Killian site were filled with sand. This was so that the possible explosion of any remaining explosives could be prevented. Besides a few stumps from the south gate entrance to the former facility, and submerged debris from its destroyed ceiling, little remains of what was once a major U-boat mooring and repair facility. And now let's return to that fateful night in January of 1945. We need to remember that living and working on board a U-boat was cramped at best, hellish at worst. Submariners would often go out for weeks and even months on patrol. That is why it was so important that they be allowed to rest and sleep in decent quarters when possible even when still on duty at Kiel Harbor. That was the value that an accommodation or residential ship such as the Dar es Salaam offered, a place for U-boaters to relax and recharge before the physical and mental rigors of re-entering the ocean depths in their steel tubes. That night of January 13, 1945, was unremarkable for those men staying on board the Dar es Salaam. There had been an air raid alarm earlier that night, and so the ship had been evacuated. The men then returned once the all-clear was given, and some of them congregated in the entertainment room on board. This room was a large, semi-circle space located just under the bridge. Its configuration was perfect for the projection of films. Lightproof curtains were used to cover windows during film sessions. At some point during the film being shown, there was an explosion in the projector. At that time, the celluloid used for film stock was highly flammable, even explosive. The explosion was immense, given the relatively small area, and the curtains and other flammables aided in the quick spread of fire. Furthermore, the sudden flash of flame had sucked most of the oxygen out of the air, making escape even more difficult. Attempts to smash the glass windows failed, and the smoke no doubt grew thick very quickly. A handful of men closest to the exit were able to crawl to safety. What transpired was the slow asphyxiation of the many men that had not been able to escape. Theirs was a slow, agonizing death. Among the men who died in that awful freak fire on the Dar es Salaam were three U-boat commanders. The oldest of the three U-boat commanders who died that night was Wilhelm August Franken, born in 1914 in Schildische, Bielefeld, in North Rhine-Westphalia. Franken began his naval career in April 1935. He served as a gunnery officer in the Danube Flotilla at the outbreak of World War II and then transferred to the U-Boat Division in October 1940. He served as first watch officer on U-331 until January 1942 to undertake his Kommandantenschüler or Commander-in-Training course before taking over command of the Type 7 Cu-565 in March of that year. His successes included the sinking of the British destroyer HMS Partridge in the Mediterranean on December 18, 1942. At the time of the fire in which he died, Franken was a staff officer at U-Boat Command under Admiral Friedeberg. Next was Siegfried Luden, born in 1916 in Neubrandenburg in the Mecklenburg-Vorpommern region. He had commenced his military life as an airman with the Luftwaffe in 1938, but switched to U-boat training in April 1940. For 10 months after his training, Luden served as an adjutant on various U-boat flotillas. Showing skill as a submarine leader, he took command of the newly commissioned U-188 in early 1943. His very first patrol was a huge success for him when his submarine sank the British destroyer HMS Beverly. His second patrol took him to Penang in Malaya, in which he picked up tons of tin and other much-needed supplies for the German war cause. Luden's command saw the sinking of eight other ships hailing from the United States, Britain, Greece, Norway, and Chile. He would be awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross in recognition of his successful military leadership, as well as extreme bravery in battle. Luden would then be appointed to staff positions at the Lorient base in France, as well as Kiel. 
Georg von Bitter was the third and youngest of the three U-boat commanders who died in the Dar es Salaam fire. He's also the one of the three for which there is very little information available online. Nevertheless, von Bitter was born in 1921 in Hötensleben, Helmstead in Lower Saxony. He joined the Kriegsmarine in June 1939, less than three months before the outbreak of World War II. Clearly a talented naval officer, he would be in command of U-750 from June 1943 to September 1944. It is presumed that he too was working as a high-level officer of the U-boat command at Kiel on the night of the fire that killed him, as well as fellow commanders Wilhelm Franken and Siegfried Luden. One thing that is striking about these three U-boat commanders is just how young they were. After all, Wilhelm August Franken, Siegfried Luden, and Georg von Bitter were just 30, 28, and 23 years of age, respectively, when they perished in the fire on board the Dar es Salaam. These men had already commanded numerous U-boats patrols all over the world in their 20s. This was not uncommon during the Second World War, of course, nor was it peculiar to only the German Navy, but it is nevertheless astounding to think about just how young so many of these men were, with all that rank and responsibility on their shoulders. It not only highlights the unique nature of war, but how all too often it grabs and extinguishes the youngest of lives.